Hey there, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week on the 302, we are at the Smyrna Museum learning about one of the oldest towns in Delaware. What were its residents like? What did they dress like? Where did they live? You'll find out the 302 is headed your way. Welcome to the Smyrna Museum. We're here with Jim Wolf, who is with the Duck Creek Historical Society. Jim, thank you so much for allowing us to come for a visit. I'm very thrilled that you're here. So let's talk a little bit. First of all, you see this big brick building when you roll up to visit. There's so much inside that's fascinating and it really has a deep roots in history. But let's talk about the building first. When was it built? The uh barracks, which it is called, uh, was built about 1790, and it was built by a miller um, who had one of the grist mills in town for his daughter and son-in-law. So Smyrna has had several names along the way yes. since it was established. So talk to us a little bit about, you know, the unique, I guess the second oldest to Lewis, is that right? I think so, yes. Yeah, talk to us about the history. Um, Smyrna was originally called Duck Creek Crossroads, and that is because it was on what was called the Maryland Road and the King's Highway. And it was a center for commerce, uh, that it had three grist mills at the end of the, of the 18th century, and it shipped out, not by rail, but by boat, shipped out um, grain and um, flour and lumber products primarily, uh, as, as well as pottery. But it became, it's a small town, it's always been a small town, but it was, it had com commercial import, which um, caused it to have the first bank south of Wilmington, uh, that it had money where you wouldn't usually associate that with small towns and consequently um, the fathers of this town were mostly connected to the shipping trade and consequently when the railroads started uh, in the 1840s and whatever the founding fathers did not want a railroad to come in town so a, another town was formed uh, just to the east of us um, which became known as originally as uh, Smyrna Depot. So when someone comes to visit, you have so many artifacts that really speak to the history of Smyrna and its several names um, over the years. But there's, there's a piece behind us, um, the table and chairs by Reverend Piner Mansfield. That's really something that you're very proud of. We are, that uh, Piner Mansfield, we really knew very little about Piner Mansfield until we got the drop leaf table and the side table, which he made in the 1830s. He uh, was a uh, craftsperson who, uh, as a cabinet maker, maker, made these two things, as well as we have subsequently found out that he was a clockmaker and a watchmaker. He was also a silversmith, and more importantly, he was the minister of Asbury Church here in town. Um, he also was a lieutenant in the Delaware militia and um, was a treasurer of the town of Smyrna and served as a commissioner from time to time. So the pieces, how were they unique? Well, they're unique because they're tied to him and they were made here in Smyrna. And cabinet making is something you don't usually associate with such a small town. Sure. Now, I have done a lot of shows and seen a lot of things, but I have never seen anything like that hair wreath. What is that all about? Uh, this hair wreath was made in 1864 by a Smyrna girl who was 16 that 
all of the hair in that hair wreath is made up of hair that came from her family members. And the way they made it, uh, essentially you would take thin wire and bend it into the flowers and leaves, etc., and then cover them mm -hmm. with the hair. And it has persevered a long time. It's really unique. Now, is this something that was done um, as, a, as a habit or a hobby back then? Hair jewelry and uh, hair art was very common from, uh, well, during the early part of the 19th century up through um, the 1870s. And that we usually associate hair jewelry with persons who left to go to the Civil War and they left their families with a piece, a lock of their hair, keepsake. and a keepsake, yes. And that, that was then um, kept through the many generations. And we've had um, an exhibit on hair jewelry, et cetera, but this is our uh, shining piece. It really is gorgeous. Uh, another gorgeous piece, this piano. Tell us about that. Well, this was a gift to the museum. It is a pump organ, which was made probably in the 1880s. And uh, one day while doing a tour, I had no idea that it was still playable. However, a girl sat down and she started pumping it and played the keys. And obviously the bellows still work after 150 years. So. That's one of the things that I've noticed. Um, when you come, you can you can sort of touch things and sit yes. down. And of course, there's always someone here to make sure that you don't go too far. But it, you really want people to feel a sense of history. We feel it's important to have our museum be visitor friendly. And consequently, rather than have roped off rooms, we not only invite people in, but to sit down and uh, enjoy themselves while they're here. Because there's so much to learn, and we're going to learn about Smyrna and the war when we return. Hi, I'm Nancy Alexander. I'm the director of the Rehoboth Beach Museum in Rehoboth Beach, Delaware. And I had a blast today sharing our city's history with the 302. Welcome back. We are at the Smyrna Museum. Now, Jim, when you climb the stairs, it's like going back in time to get a glimpse of what it was like or what uh, soldiers would have been dressed like in many of the different wars that, that we've experienced. I want to start with the Revolutionary War. Of course, Smyrna was established before the Revolutionary War, but you have replicas of what some of your townspeople might have worn in, you know, fighting for our country. One of the uniforms that is upstairs is a replica of what a uh, Delaware militia soldier would have worn during the Revolution. Um, the hat is unique, and unfortunately, the hat was very similar to what Hessians wore during the Revolutionary War, and many Delaware militiamen were being shot as being enemy, and they were not. So a change had to be made in the headgear um, in order not to be picked off as an enemy soldier. That um, at that time during the revolution, Smyrna, rather than being called Smyrna, um, or even Smyrna Crossroads, was uh, just the crossroads. And most Revolutionary War tracks, which you will find, will refer to this place as the crossroads. Now, when you walk down the hallway, you go into a room that has um, a very striking um, portrait of a colonel. Yes. And you have um, artifacts from, or I don't know if it's a replica, you can tell me, from the Civil War and from World War I. Can you talk about those? Yes. Uh, the very large portrait, which you will see, is of Colonel Wilmer, and Colonel Wilmer was the provost marshal for the state of Delaware during the Civil War. His office was across the street from this building, 
and in August of 1863, the draft lottery for the state of Delaware, all four jurisdictions, the three counties plus Wilmington, were drawn on the front porch of our building. Interestingly, the law said that the uh, names um, must be drawn from a drum by a person who was blind. And as the newspaper account of that event um, tells, that the boy who was chosen was blind from birth, but because the law said he had to be blindfolded, he was further blindfolded when pulling those names uh, for the four different jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about um, the room that um, contains everything from World War II. I know that you've got a lot of things that were donated by people who served, who lived in Smyrna. You know, there are uniforms, there's a uh, brass, uh, like a plate with a, the gentleman's name on it. It's like a name plate. Can you talk to us a little bit about the artifacts there? Uh, everything in the room uh, for World War II are authentic uniforms which were worn by people of Smyrna or connected to people from Smyrna, which have been loaned to us for this, this exhibit. And we have all sorts of things that were uh, connected with World War II. And we're certainly happy to have those things from the people of the community and be able to tell a true story of the men and women black and white who served here in, uh, in their country's service. It must just be a really interesting job to, you know, you have so many artifacts and so many stories to tell, not just on the first level, but the second level. So talk to me a little bit about, you know, when somebody comes um, just kind of sharing, you know, a wartime history of Smyrna, that must be rewarding. It is. and that. Um, Unfortunately, we're losing more and more people who have first-person knowledge of the events of World War II when Smyrna residents had lookouts for enemy airplanes, etc. that up on um, South Street there were places where people were uh, 24 hours a day on uh, assignment, if you will, uh, though they were totally volunteer, uh, to find uh, enemy airplanes, air aircraft, if they were to come, which they never did, thank goodness. Well, Jim, when we come back, we're going to take a tour of the kitchen and then look at some more modest lodgings. We'll be right back. This is Doug at the AMC Museum, welcoming back the 302. Welcome back. Now, Jim, when we took a tour before we sat down to do our taping, I was struck by the kitchen. It looks like someone, you know, was in the middle of ironing, just put their ironing down and, you know, maybe went outside for lemonade or whatever they're up to. So you have it set up deliberately so people can kind of get a feel of what it was like. Tell us about the time period and, and the intention that you're trying to share with visitors. Up till about six years ago, we, there was a 1972 kitchen in the kitchen area, and we decided we wanted to make it part of the tour. So we took out that kitchen and replicated what we thought that kitchen may have looked like in the 1920s. And we have a 1926 stove there. We have a, um, a commercial um, stove that was used to heat irons so that you could iron continuously from one thing to another. We also have a sits tub, which is interesting. It always draws uh, children's attention because why is there a bathtub in the kitchen? And we point out that water from a well is extremely cold and you want it heated. And we tell the story that the tradition was that baths were taken by the husband first and then the wife and the children in descending order of birth, which gave rise to the story that uh, don't throw the baby out with the bath water is the expression which came from that, meaning not get rid of the good with the bad. So um, the, when we did the kitchen, when we redid the kitchen, 
we utilized the 1905 cabinet and rebuilt uh, another cabinet using exterior windows so that we could display more of the things that we have been given. I know there's a lot of glass in there, a lot of blue glass, and I really enjoy the spice and the, the additives um, selection. Somebody really took care of that stuff. Yes, and we're very pleased that one of our board members was very, he and his wife were very big into um, uh, collections of glassware and have loaned them to us to display so that we can better interpret the uh, life of not only Smyrna but throughout the country. Now this house was indicative of someone who was well to do. Well at least lower middle class. Right. Yes. So you have outside you have an example about the same time 1790s ish yes. an example of more modest um, lodgings. Talk to us about the plank house. Most people in Delaware would have lived in a building that would have been similar to the Plank House. Um, a number of years ago, the building was slated for uh, uh, practice burning by the fire department. And luckily, it had four layers of covering on it, one of which was asbestos, which they took off and found the Plank House. Um, the Plank House derived from early Swedish settlers who brought with them the log cabin and the plank house idea was a new innovation on the old idea of a Swedish log cabin. And um, uh, there is chinking between the logs and that chinking traditionally was replaced every year. It was made of horsehair and straw and manure and so it had to be replaced every year. And we have just replaced the chinking with a synthetic, which will um, uh, expand up to 40%. It's a, um, something that will make sure that the house stays um, watertight throughout the next 100 years or 200 years or a little more. When you walk through the doors, it's like going back in time because you have the working, cooking fireplace, you have um, a spinning wheel, and a butter churn. I don't think that I have seen a butter churn made out of a barrel before. We have two different kinds of butter churns. One is the old traditional butter churn, and the other butter churn is a barrel, which at one point was hooked up to a dog or goat trot and that could turn this and therefore human uh, effort was not necessary in order to make your butter. Sure, sure. And I also really um, enjoyed the, the dolls. Uh, we have corn husk dolls which, have been, which would have been very traditional to the time period and um, common here. Yeah, and I, they would probably, kids would probably make their own. Yes, probably. So it's set up the way a first floor would be, because everything would happen on the first floor. You would be there during the day, you would, you would knit or weave or spin and you'd cook. But at night, um, I guess you'd go upstairs, there is right? A, there is a, a stairwell, which is much like a ladder that goes up to what is the second, second floor. And we believe that the house, um, was probably made by a craftsperson um, because it came from a section of town which was known as Irish Town. And um, secondly, that instead of a sleeping loft, there was a whole uh, second floor for sleeping. Therefore, it indicated to us, it indicates to us, that uh, the person who built it was of uh, um, upper lower class, if you will, or lower middle class. And um, uh, we, our next goal is to um, have shaped um, sleeping facilities for the second floor. We haven't gotten to that yet, but that's on our to-do list. So if someone wants to come, and I highly recommend coming out to check out the Smyrna Museum, if someone wants to come, you know, is there somewhere where they can find out where your hours are? Are you on Facebook? Talk to us about that. We are on Facebook and our um, 
phone number is in the phone, phone book. Our regular hours are Saturday from 10 to 1. However, call us and we will accommodate you that uh, we're glad to have visitors anytime. So much history to share. Jim, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Thank you for coming. And we'll be right back. For more information on the Smyrna Museum, you can visit DuckCreekHistoricalSociety.org. That'll do it for this week's episode of the 302. We're going to leave you with some beauty shots from the air of downtown Smyrna. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. Tell them you saw it on the 302.